السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Brothers and sisters everywhere welcome back We resume our program Ask Kuda That is the first live episode after a long vacation The sacred journey of Hajj May Allah accept from all of us اللهم آمين um, I would like to remind you with our contact information in the beginning of this episode, beginning with the phone numbers, area code 002-011-2500-8679, alternatively area code 002-0100-246-4583, and the email address is ask at huda.tv, and the Facebook page is Dr. Muhammad Salah Official. Barakallahu feekum. Uh, while waiting for your valuable calls and concerns, I would like to tackle some of your pending questions which I received on my page. Um, the first one is from <coughs> Sang Hyangang. Sang says in her question, obviously she's a sister, if a Muslim, if a Muslim receives peanuts or snacks, for example, from a non-Muslim guy with, her, with his bare hands, and uh, give it to her. Is that okay? Okay. Um, if you're talking about whether the non-Muslim is pure or impure, tahir or najis, here the impurity is not physical. I mean, I can shake hands with any non-Muslims. I'm talking about a male, of course. A male shake hands with another male who's a non-Muslim, no problem. Even if the person happens to be not in a state of tahara, because the physical impurities would not be transformed or transferred from one person to another by shaking hands. And we have a reference to this. But if you're talking about a male and a female, even if this male is a Muslim, the sheikh is giving you some gifts, snacks or peanuts, as you say, uh, and we happen to uh, shake hands or touch hands, a male and a female who are neither a husband and wife nor mahram to each other. The word mahram means that uh, they can never get married forever because they are like brothers and sisters, uncles and uh, uh, nieces for innocence, okay? Aunts and nephews. These are the maharim and we refer to it in the ayah of Surah An-Nisa before حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ مُمَّهَاتُكُمْ وَبَنَاتُكُمْ وَخَوَاتُكُمْ وَعَمَّاتُكُمْ The ayah, the reference. So in this case, it is not permissible to shake hands between a man and a woman who are not uh, either a husband and wife nor a permanent mahram to each other. A permanent mahram would exclude the non-permanent, a person who is not allowed for you to marry, like your brother-in-law. So long as you are married to his brother, it is not permissible, of course, to marry this person. And as long as you are married to this woman, it is not permissible to marry her sister, right? So she is not your mahram, and you are not a mahram to her. We're talking about the permanent maharim, where it is not permissible forever for a person to marry this woman, or the woman to marry this man. So it's okay to shake hands between each other, and you can travel together, you can be in a state of khalwa in, uh, in case of securing or feeling secure again is the fitna and so on. Besides that, a Muslim or a non-Muslim, you're not allowed to shake hands with if he's neither a husband and wife or a mahram. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Muhammad from Bahrain. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Ask Wada. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Haj Mubarak. Jazakallahu khayran, taqabbal Allahum minna minkum. May Allah accept from all of us. Myself and my family and all the our uh, Muslim ummah who performed hajj, inshallah mubarak for them Ameen. also. Ameen, ya. May Allah make it a blessed hajj. Ameen. Inshallah, ask us dua for the next year, hopefully. Ameen, inshallah. Jazakallahu khayran. Okay. I have a, two questions. Yeah. One is, 
what are the ways we have to ask Allah the duas are the steps and we have to go according to the Quran okay then how the etiquette of asking dua from the Quran okay then can we do hair color like black or any other color it is permissible in Islam okay and if we do that uh, if the Odu is valued according to that Okay. Uh, That's it. Uh, brother Muhammad. Uh, I will not be exaggerating if I say your first question with regards to a dua, this is a lecture by itself. Inshallah, I will try to compress the answer as much as possible. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Muhammad from Nigeria. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum, brother Assalamu Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Amu alaykum as-salam, Allah barakatuh. Go ahead, I, I, I hear you. Go ahead, Brother Muhammad. Yeah, I have a question. No. Um, if someone is uh, praying um, with the Imam, maybe Fajr prayer, Mangrib, or Isha prayer, and when the Imam is reciting the Surah Surah Fatiha, is it when he recited Anin after the Surah Surah Fatiha that the congregation is supposed to say Anin? Or you're supposed to say Amin before the Imam. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Bye. Yeah, uh, that was my only question. Muhammad, do you have any other questions? Okay. No, that was my only question. Okay, I will deliver the answer immediately so that you know the viewers would follow up with the question. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whosoever's saying of Amin after the Imam recites Surah Al Fatiha coincides the saying of Amin of the Imam himself, of the angels. That means his sins will be forgiven and the invocation will be accepted. Which means you should wait until the Imam begins his Ameen, so you both say Ameen at the same time. And in fact, from that we understand that also it isn't only the followers who say Ameen, but also Al Malaika who attend the prayers, the angels also are very keen to say Amin. What is the meaning of the word Amin? Amin is itself an invocation which means, O oh Allah, accept. May Allah accept. So the saying of Amin is a confirmation of the invocation that the Imam have been invoking Allah through which is Ihdina Sarat al Mustaqim, Sarat al Ladina an Amta alayhim. Guide us to the safe path. So you should wait until the Imam begins his saying of Ameen, then you recite it along with him. Barakallahu feek. Brother Muhammad from Bahrain, the procedures and the etiquette of making uh, dua, then after word, how to make dua uh, from the Quran and, and so on. First of all, uh, you can make dua at any say time with uh, wudu or without wudu with uh, purity from major impurities or not or without in the state of Janaba at any time you can make dua because that is a ibadah which does not require a certain time or a certain condition okay assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Jabin from the case say assalamu alaikum Jabin wa alaikum assalam how are you sister Alhamdulillah, fine. How are you, brother? Just fine, Alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. Alhamdulillah, fine. How are you, brother? Brother, I'd like to ask you one question about my husband. My husband, he don't pray at all. I told him sister, so many times sister, for sister, praying, and he don't pray sister at Sister Jabin, all. Has... mute your TV set, please, first of all, because there is an echo. Just mute your TV set and, and hear me from, uh, from the handset, from your phone. Okay, now ask your question. It would be preferable though if you speak about the third person, like somebody's husband. Go ahead. Yes. So, can I? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. My husband, he don't pray. I told him so many times. Uh, I told him Hadith is an, even he don't pray. He has so many friends. They are not good at all. And sometimes he do drink with them. And... So many bad things and something like with the girls and so many things. 
I don't know how can I change him or how can I tell him. And I used to pray five times and always I pray to Allah and tell him that Allah do something or do to, to my husband become change or, you know, to become like he can motivate. So I don't know what to do. I mean, I don't know how can I make my relationship like the way Allah said in the Islamic way. So I need the solution or I need the way. I mean, I don't know what to do. If you can help me. All right. Inshallah, sister Jabin from the case. I will answer you, inshallah. Back to Brother Muhammad's question about the dua. So we said, generally speaking, that whenever you feel like making dua, you can make dua in any condition. While lying down on your bed, while driving, while mountain climbing, while swimming, anywhere, in any condition, with tahara or without tahara. But a dua and its proper etiquette would include the following. These etiquettes are recommended they are not a must. As I mentioned earlier, you can make dua in any condition. Such as these etiquettes which enhance the dua's acceptance and qabul is number one, being in a state of tahara, facing the qibla, introducing to your dua by praising Allah the Almighty, glorifying Him as He taught us in Surah Al-Fatiha. We begin by praising Allah, exalting Allah. Then it's highly recommended to second that by sending the peace and the blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu That really enhances the acceptance of your dua. Then you present your mas'ala. You ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and when you make dua, you should be certain that your dua will be answered in a way or another. I shall explain that later, inshaAllah. It will be certainly answered. And that is the meaning of Ud'u Allah wa antum muqinuna bil ijaba. And you should not do what is known as istithna. You say, well, give me this if you want to, if you will, if you wish. Well, it is understood he would only give you whenever he wants to. But you are asking him and you don't know his will. So you better ask without saying in shit or if you wish or if you will. Many people actually do this. And whenever you make dua, you should understand that you are asking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you should not say, just give me this little bit. Because like you're dealing with a human being or somebody who is miser. Or you are afraid to ask for too much that you will not be given any. No, ask as much as you can. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sufficient for all the needs of his creatures. Inna Allah wasi'un alim. Thirdly, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Yustajabu li ahadikum ma lam yad'u bi ithmin. So as long as your dua is something good, asking for righteous demand, for good things, for health, for wealth, and not asking to hurt others or cursing others without justification or to sever the relationship between you and kinship, then your dua will be answered. As the Nabi wasallam said, يُسْتَجَابُ يُسْتَجَابُ Which means, the dua will be definitely answered of any of you. As long as you do not invoke Allah for a sin. Somebody is dying to be with this woman or to facilitate for him to work in a bank which is conventional or to strike a deal which is based on interest, riba or haram. So keep asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is not going to listen to such thing because the dua itself is wrong. And Allah is most merciful if He's going to answer every dua that the person makes. Sometimes we invoke Allah with invocations to hurt ourselves. وَهَدْعُ الْإِنسَانُ بِالشَّرِّ دُعَاءَهُ بِالْخَيْرِ وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ عَجُولًا You see Allah's mercy that whenever a person invokes Allah for an evil, he thinks that it may be good. Or it would satisfy his desire. How many parents, whenever they are upset with their children, they ask Allah to punish their children? I know of one case where the child upset his father. So the father said, may Allah break your neck. May Allah break your neck. And subhanAllah, in less than a couple hours, he went swimming. And this person was a great swimmer. So once he took a dive, but he hit the bottom of the pool. And he was paralyzed. Not only broke his neck, the, yeah, through the neck he destroyed his vertebra and uh, spinal cord and he is entirely paralyzed for life. Subhanallah. 
So if Allah is going to answer every dua, even if it is wrong, sometimes we invoke Allah, we ask for destruction without justification or even to hurt ourselves. Sometimes when the person is in adversity, say, Oh Allah, cause me to die. You will die. But perhaps this is not the right time to die. Perhaps if you live longer, you will prosper and you will get closer to Allah. So you never know. Uh, then after you finish your dua, also you send the peace, uh, the peace and the blessings upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these are some of the etiquettes of uh, dua. Uh, Al-Quran is full of invocations and now they're compiled in, you know, you can find them in several websites, you can find them in uh, uh, small booklets, in even some apps. They compile all the supplications of the Qur'an. رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً رَبَّنَا إِنَّنَا سَمِعْنَا مُنَادِيًا يُنَادِي لِلْإِمَانِ So you can actually invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through those invocations. And as long as you're not reciting them as an ayah of the Qur'an, you still can use them in your sujood, or you can use them without the state of tahara. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Yusra from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Yusra. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum. Uh, may salam. Allah bless you and shower you with all the mercy that He has. I mean, and same um, to you, Sister Yusra. Thank you so much. What a beautiful dua. Um, I have two. I have a few questions actually. Mm -hmm. um, I have a problem with um, some relatives regarding um, an issue, an, an Islamic issue about gender mixing at the workplace, and I understand that. Um, Islam holds the position that there shouldn't be a mixing between genders at the workplace. But they presented a few contentions that I was unable to um, answer them in, in a good way with evidence as well. So the first one is, if mixing is haram, then why is it allowed in Hajj? Mm. And the second is, um, why don't we say that we can allow mixing, but each person is up to him to set the limits and the guidelines um, so that he doesn't um, transcend beyond the work um, mm. task. Okay. And um, also, some, somebody said something like, um, it would be impossible to incorporate everyone, um, like, for example, women in a certain place and men in a certain place, because that would be too costly. And if it's not practical, then how does Fiqh deal with this issue? Okay. And as to... Um, Women, for instance, we say that um, we are allowed to work um, in teaching professions or in nursing, um, but how, how is it dealing with other people who are not really fit for such skills? They don't have these skills. Does that mean that all Muslims have to be like teachers or they have to be like nurses because these are the only places where you can find a segregated environment? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Barakallah fiki. I got it. Do you have any other questions? Next, please. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Asia from the case. Say, Assalamu alaikum, Sister Asia. Assalamu alaikum, rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum, salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Haj mabroo, Sheikh. Thank you so much. May Allah accept from all of us. Jazakillahu khayran. Ameen. Ameen. Sheikh, I have two questions. No. Uh, question number one. Uh, can the people uh, who are going for the Hajj from Jeddah, uh, do tawafal vida uh, uh, um, after some time uh, when the, I mean they, they finish the Hajj and then they come back here in Jeddah and then after one week they can go for tawafal vida back and uh, this was said that before uh, some people used to say the scholars uh, allowed this to do those who are residing in Jeddah so I just wanted to confirm and question number two uh, is there any ha such hadith that uh, a woman uh, should uh, be uh, uh, not allowed or uh, not permissible to share the bed if the husband is angry? And what are the reasons for that anger? Uh, any references there? I'm is sorry, I didn't get the second question, Sister Asya. The, the, the wife doing what if the husband gets angry? Assalamu alaikum. Sister Asya, assalamu alaikum. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Your second, second question, question, please. Yes. Is there any uh, such hadith is the where the husband is allowed not to share the bed with his wife? Mm. On, on what reason? 
And where is the, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, and what is the reference for that? No, Sister Asya, I, I understand the question, but it is not clear. Who is not allowed to share bed with the other partner? I mean, do you mean that the husband deprives a wife from sharing bed with him or vice versa? Husband, husband, I mean, husband is saying that I will not share the bed. It is in Islam because I'm angry with you. Oh, I so see. So what, what, what are the <coughs> conditions for that? Mm. And is this right? Okay. Okay, thank you, Sister Asya. I'm just writing the ayah and the reference so that when I come to your question, I will remember, insha'Allah. And I hope the brothers will get it ready. Excuse me. Okay, Sister Asya, you have a question. Muhammad from Bahrain, his second question. Dying the hair. It is permissible to change the gray hair, the gray color, with any color other than the black. And the Nabi recommended dyeing the hair with henna because it is nutritive to the hair, to the scalp, and it doesn't have any side effects. And when he entered Mecca, he said to the companions when he saw Abu Bakr's father, with his hair was all gray, he said, you got to change this gray color by any other color, but avoid the black. So avoiding the black is a command, which means that using the black in this case is uh, <coughs> forbidden. Uh, <coughs> exempt from that, excuse me. If the person is uh, young and on the, on the battlefield, okay, some people go gray hair even though they're very young. And on the battlefield and facing the enemies, uh, seeing the gray hair is a sign of weakness and old age, so they exempt from that discondition. But besides that, you can use other colors but avoid the black. Jazakallah khair. Make a wudu with the hair dye. <coughs> it does not invalidate your ablution because it does not have what we call it. Uh, um, it does not leave like a layer over the hair that separates the water from mixing with the hair or reaching the scalp. It's not like the nail polish, for instance. Type. So the wudu will be perfectly valid in this case. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Sally from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Go ahead, Sister Sally. Um, Sheikh Mohammed, I have two questions. Yeah. My first question is about bankruptcy. Um, right now, we used to live outside Egypt 20 years ago. Uh, my parents um, bought a bakery, and it was a loan from the bank. But however, they filed bankruptcy after that. Now, 20 years after, we've, uh, now we live in Egypt. And we realized what we did was wrong. So I, I don't know right now, we can't go back. We're not going back uh, to America. So we don't know what to do. Like, are we going to be accounted for this money? And if the bank allows the bankruptcy, is it still harm for us to file bankruptcy? Okay. I got your question. My second question is, right now my sister does vow to the Christians online. So sometimes she looks for verses from the Bible. So I, um, I'm not sure if that's correct because uh, I'm not sure there's a hadith where Omar ibn Khattab, he opened the Torah and from the Prophet, and, he, and I'm not sure, but he said, um, why as long she, as you have the... Why is she quoting or studying some verses from the Bible? Uh, to do dawah, to convince the Christians... Um, so, so she can bring him to Islam. And what is her background in Islamic education? Um, she doesn't really have any. She just does a lot of research online, and uh, that's it. <laughs> okay, I got your question. Thank you, Sister uh, Sally. Bank, Ropsy. Be careful. <coughs> All right, thank you. Uh, brother... Uh, Uh, I guess we'll have to take a short break and inshallah we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Please stay tuned.
imagine at the end yeah, they were the ones they were the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they had the hardest lives he assumed that he had some kind of superiority and he was a better more chosen you know a select better person because he had this wealth and then you look at all the other people who had wealth and some of them were the worst people he had Fir'aun, Fir'aun and Fir'aun, Qa- Qarun. reviving your niya time and again time and again uh, that you're doing it sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most of the youth they think Oh, I'm gonna pray when I'm old. It's okay now. I'll have fun. Have fun in my life. Later on, I'll work. I'll go my bed. I'll pray five times a day, and all these things. They think that that's later on in their life, and they don't know when, when, when they will die. I mean, who's your role model? Khadija radiallahu And why? Because she was Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's wife, and she was the first lady to believe in Islam. Huda TV's social media sites are the best way to contact us from anywhere around the world. Stay connected with Huda TV's latest news and programs through Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Skype, and Instagram. It's fast and easy. Stay up to date with your favorite shows and scholars today. وجعلوا لله اندادا ليضلوا عن سبيله قل تمتعوا فان مصيركم الى النار قل لعبادي الذين امنوا يقيموا الصلاه وينفقوا مما رزقناهم سرا وعلانيه وَيُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيَةً مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ يَوْمٌ لَا بَيْعٌ فِيهِ وَلَا خِلَالٌ اللَّهُ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ وَأَنْزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَأَخْرَجَ بِهِ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ رِزْقًا لَكُمْ فأخرج به من الثمرات رزقا لكم وسخر لكم الفلك لتجري في البحر بأمره وسخر لكم الأنهار وسخر لكم الشمس والقمر دائبين وسخر لكم الليل والنهار وآتاكم من كل ما سألتموه وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَظَلُومٌ كَفَّارٌ السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome back um, the question which is due to answer is from Sister Jabin from the case A, uh, who said that the husband does not pray at all, despite the fact that she's been advising him for years. Sometimes he drinks, he's going with a bad company. What should she do? One thing is enough to determine whether this person is worth living with or not. And this decision to some people is very hard to make, and to others, it's like piece of cake. Subhanallah, 
It did not take Ismail alayhi salam a split of a second. When his father dropped an advice for him, he did not even see him. But he left an advice that you need to change your doorstep. He understood from that your wife is not really a good wife. Get rid of her. And his father is a prophet. I'm not saying that anyone would say to another, uh, you know, get rid of your spouse right away, you separate. La. I'm talking about a condition like this. Years after years, giving da'wah to him, advising him, praying for him, recommending him to do the basics to pray. He doesn't do any of that. Rather, he's even indulging into drinking and bad company and illicit relationship and so on. If he doesn't want to stop, give him the ultimatum. Whether you do have children or you don't, you give him the, ul- the ultimatum. Either you stop or we separate. How beautiful when Asiya bint Muzahim, the Pharaoh's wife, and she was the wife of the Pharaoh. She said, I want all of that. I don't want this filth. She said, Rabbi binili indaka baytan fil jannah. Wana jini min fara'awna wa amale. She doesn't want the whole dunya. If the person does not pray and insisted on not praying, then he is not a Muslim. And if there is a Muslim court in a Muslim state and the case is presented before him and he refuses, then they will separate between the spouses. They are alone, drinking, indulging into illicit relationship. Am I being harsh? Yes, I am. Because sometimes some, when, you, when you visit uh, a doctor, he says, I guess you need to visit an oncologist. Then the oncologist says, there is a part that must be removed. The surgeon will do that. Then it must be removed. It's, it's, it's malignant. It is malignant. It must be removed from the body. So if there is a family member who is malignant and is causing disturbance to the whole family to the point that he can ruin the whole family, this person severed all his relationship or her relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then is not worth living with. So the person, I hope, he is listening to me or whoever is in this condition. Allah bless you the wife who advises you to pray, advises you to give up on the bad company, to be with good people, to quit the bad things and she keeps praying for you. If you do not benefit of any of that, then severing would be the solution. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Um Hassan from the USA. Assalamu alaikum Sister Um Hassan. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh Salah, how are you? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking, Sister Muhassan. Barakallahu fiki. Sheikh Salah, barakallahu fikum for the whole team of uh, uh, Ask Khuda. Uh, Sheikh Salah, I have a question. It's for my friend, but it's really very important. Uh, um, a boy and a girl, they got uh, married. The girl used to live in USA and the boy in India. They got married, but uh, he cannot come to USA, so this marriage didn't last for long. And they have a baby now. So the girl asked for divorce. And the boy was back home. He sent the divorce papers, like notarized divorce papers with the lawyers and everything, sign on it. So is it considered kula, kula or divorce? And she had the idda of three months and ten days. So is this a kula or divorce? And is there any option for reconciliation if they if they are willing for the baby's sake because they have a baby? Right. Is that understood, Sheikh? Sister Umu Hassan, you said the husband signed a paper. And he sent her the divorce letter, certified and notary public, right? Sheikh uh, I can't hear you. Okay, uh, I got your question, you inshallah. You your question? I will answer you, inshallah. Thank you, Ummu Hassan. Barakallah fiki. If you guys allow me to begin by answering your question, then inshallah I'll come back to Sister Yusra and Sister Asya and Sa'ali Um A person was living in India, got married to a girl living in the States for a reason or another, marriage didn't work out, and they have a child, and there is a state of separation. She wants to recognize whether this separation is a divorce 
or khula. And what difference would it make? Al khula is if she demanded divorce and she gave him all his financial rights like the dowry and whatever he spent, he was not willing to, to, to divorce her, he doesn't want to. And there is no serious problem, but she doesn't want to live with him. That's called khula. If that is the case, and based on her demand, or their agreement, or if she file a case against his will, and finally she got the khula, in this case, he does not have the right of reconciling without her consent within the idda, because the khula would not give him the right of a raja. Divorce, first and second, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Baqarah, الطلاق مرتان فإمساك بمعروف أو تسريح بإحسان we call it revocable so he can revoke his divorce even without her consent and the idda sister is not three months and ten days rather the idda is three periods or the three purifications that follow the period if she is a woman who experiences the menses if she does not then we're talking about three lunar months not three months and ten days okay now, what if he divorced her willingly? She said, divorce me. He said, okay. And he sent her the divorce letter. Yes, in this case, he may revoke his word. Within the idda, which we agreed. Three periods, three menses, or three purifications that follow the menses. Okay? Then we said in Surah Al-Talaq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the idda will be three months in case that the woman does not experience the period. For a reason or another, it's hard to tell. Then it will be thalathat ashur, three lunar months. What about if it is the worst case scenario, khula? And he does not have a chance to even reconcile if he desired but they both now desire to reconcile for the sake of the child. Piece of cake. If this is their first or second divorce, whether divorce or khula, no problem. You can reconcile, but it would demand a new marriage contract, a new dowry, a new shahada, and the consent of her guardian. Because this is a brand new marriage. A brand new marriage. Similarly, if it was just a divorce, as I said, if it was the first or the second divorce, and it's revocable, and the idda lapsed, the idda is over. Ten months later, they decided, for the sake of the child, we would like to reconcile. No problem. But we will begin from the scratch, new aqd, new marriage contract, with the consent of the guardian, the consent of the bride, and the witnesses, and the dowry, like was starting from the scratch. Barakallah fikum sister Ummu Hassan and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring reconciliation to every family who are having an affliction like that. <clears throat> sister Yusra from Egypt, I love the way you presented your question, Sister Yusra. Jazakumullah khair. And you know how in Egypt people are very argumentative and they can argue forever. And uh, whether they're convinced or not. You know, I wonder... If those people happen to take public transportations and jump in the bus, you know, when I used to go to college, it was like a nightmare to chase the bus for 500 meters, for one kilometer, and just to jump at the door to put one foot or at the window or whatever. Men and women were squeezed like tuna in a tuna can. This is what we mean with al-ikhtilat. Mixing men and women. Where literally men and women are squeezed. Absolutely this is forbidden. It doesn't make any sense. Even away from religion. If you're talking about sexual harassment which is happening day and night. It is because of that. It is inevitable. It is unavoidable. As long as there is this permissible free mingling. So what would it be if we have private buses, private transportations for females who, by the way, outnumber men? Peace of mind. So why don't we do that? If we're talking now about 
common sense. We're talking about logic. Now we're talking also from a religious perspective, which is there is no comparison between being stuck in the bus like tuna fish or in any means of transportation, uh, you call it the trains or whatever, the micro buses, or while performing Hajj. At the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, women used to attend the prayer in the masjid where they were mixing with men. Yet they prayed with the Prophet in the same masjid. Did the Prophet Sallallahu build a wall or a barrier or pull a curtain? No, he didn't. Oh, so that was kind of mixing. But what kind of mixing? Not to mix and not to cut and paste from my statement. The Prophet Sallallahu appointed a door by the rear of the masjid and said this is for a nisa, for women. And whenever the Prophet ﷺ would finish the prayer, would pause for a little before turning around so that women would depart if they want to. And imagine women wearing the proper hijab, praying with the Prophet ﷺ in the masjid, and men likewise. And in between were the minors and the kids. No problem. If this is the case, no problem. But how many disasters, molestations, Assault, sexual assaults, sexual harassment happen simply because of the patient and the doctor are alone in the checkup room. This is not only in, in the Muslim countries. It's more common in non-Muslim countries, right? It happened with the President of the United States of America. And the guy who used to try him, and he was given a speech of how a person should be pure, should be honorable. He himself, he himself was actually having a scandal with his secretary. Likewise, subhanAllah, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whenever a man and a woman who are neither a husband and wife nor related to each other, they are not maharim, happen to be together behind closed doors, they are not alone. Their third is a shaitan. This is a kind of mingling which is forbidden. Have your relatives ever attended a wedding party in this country where they're living at? And they have seen the free mingling and mixing and what happens when men and women get up and dance together and they take photos and it becomes like, uh, like a mess. SubhanAllah, there was a video and I just saw it recently. It shows that those people were dancing, men and women together, jumping to the ceiling. Then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the whole slab collapsed and the building collapsed on top of them. My question is, what would be the fate of a person who dies in this condition? Touching a woman who's not lawful to him, dancing along with a woman who may be the, the wife of his friend or whatever. Yes, we attended cycle meetings for companies that we used to work at medical, pharmaceutical companies, even at college, and we have seen things like that. This is absolutely forbidden. If you're talking about the, the, the mingling which happens in the market normally, which happens if you're flying and you, you know, you happen to be men and women, no problem, you're flying with your mahram. If you are a teacher at the university or at a school and uh, you are a female and teaching the opposite gender in public and you're wearing your proper dress code, your hijab, no problem. Nobody says this is uh, forbidden. You exactly, um, I, I do not mean you, Sister Yusra, I mean those who are arguing with you for the sake of argument. They exactly know what kind of mingling which is restricted and forbidden. And if you're from the States or whoever, you can refer to many institutes in many states now which are only for girls. Why? And it was started by Christian conservatives at the time of Bush. Why? Because he found that it is more productive. As far as studying and focusing on education. And when I taught in institutes like that, when I taught in mixed institutes, it was very hard to convince the students, American students, to pay attention to you because they are not with you. They are in another world. Everyone is with his lover or their lover or whatever. So subhanAllah, the, the proper adab of Islam guarantees a modest society and a modest family and a modest individual. Barakallah fikum. Sister Asya, 
if a person has to leave to wherever, Jeddah or wherever, and did not perform tawaf al wada' because they're going back and forth, they did not go home. I have many people who are working to facilitate traveling for others. That's okay because they have not finished their manasik yet. They want to come back and do tawaf al wada' before departing from Mecca. That is permissible. Okay? Tawaf al wada' means giving a farewell to the haram whenever that is your last ahd, last thing that you're going to do in Mecca. If you're leaving, for good. You finish in your Rabb, the manasik. Um, the reference to abandoning bed or not sharing bed with uh, one's powers, if she's in a state of no shoes, if she's disobedient to Allah or disobedient, causing trouble at home without right, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاللَّاتِ تَخَافُونَ نُشُوزَهُنَّ فَاعِضُوهُنَّ وَهْجُرُوهُنَّ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ وَضْرِبُهُنَّ The second option is abandoning them in bed, only in bed, and not to disclose that to anyone, not even your children, those who are living with you in the same house should not know about that. So you will be doing this as a sign of detesting and objecting to the way of the misbehavior. Okay? Sister Sally, last caller uh, from Egypt. Um, many people, by the way, this is just to show the world how Islam maintains the rights of non-Muslims as well as Muslims. Many people who happen to do business in the States, in Europe, in North America, and they collected a loan or they charged thousands or hundreds of thousands to their credit card. Then, as you all know, that simply, if you file for bankruptcy, you're off the hook. That's it. Only five years later, you can start building up a new credit and do the same thing again. This is absolutely haram. What about if somebody was sincere, loyal, he just took a loan in order to start a business? This person is honest. But the business did not prosper. The business did not work out. So he filed for bankruptcy because he couldn't settle the loan and ended up accumulating a huge amount of interest and so on. Oh, according to their constitution, when you file for bankruptcy, you're off the hook. Halas, no problem. Some people actually take this money and buy properties in their countries back home. They buy buildings and cars and they start business. This money is 100% unlawful. Haram. Stealing. In your case, that they took a loan, they started the business, and the business vanished, and the money that they took from the loan, nothing is left out of it. So they filed for bankruptcy. Would that exempt you from paying back the money? No. When a man died at the time of the Prophet wasallam, and he knew that he was in debt, he asked, if anyone is going to settle his debt, or he is not going to lead his funeral prayer. You know, a shaheer, all his sins will be forgiven, except that. Because the debt would not be waived simply because you died. When you die, you have aqilah, family members, ears. If you leave a billion dollars, they're going to take it and distribute it. And if you leave a billion of debt, it must be also distributed among those who can afford to pay based on the shares of their inheritance. Wow. This is, this is really amazing. So what I'm trying to say is, if you are in the position of paying back, you got to pay back. Uh, talking to the company or the debtor or the lender and saying, if you can pardon me because I can, because, you know, eventually... These companies and credit cards and the banks are covered with insurance. So they, anyway, when you, this is what the justification of some people who say that when I file for bankruptcy, these guys didn't lose anything. They will get their money fully with the interest from the insurance companies. The person has to deal with people as honest as he should deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you know that the lender that has pardoned you with a good will, he said, أَسْقَطُ عَنْكَ دَيْنَا I'm not going to ask you for the loan. Qaddar Allah ma I know that you tried to do business and it didn't work out. Khalas. Alhamdulillah shukla it is waived. But if filing for bankruptcy is a mean to get away with the money, 
then this money is a debt, it must be settled. And it will not be simply waived. Read in the Bible, or the Torah, or whatever books, or even the, the claims of atheists in order to argue with them, requires first, Sister Sally, that the person learns his deen. Inshallah, in the next episode, I may begin with this to show you that many Muslims do not know the basic informations about their deen. And whenever we travel here or there and we address basic information, they say, I didn't know that before. Only during this Hajj, whatever I talk about, many people, big time doctors, educated people, they say, never heard of hijab before. Wallahi. Doctors say, never heard of hijab before. I thought it's, you know, only for Arab women or whatever. And when she knew she started practicing, riba. Some people thought there is no such thing called riba. You know, halal and haram, wearing gold for men, wearing whatever. So we'll be talking about this, inshallah. So what I'm trying to say, Sister Sally, if you'd like to be a da'iya and uh, argue with non-Muslims, billatihi ahsan, study your deen first, study your aqeelah, strengthen your background of your faith, so that when you read this, you understand the failure and the shortcoming. Because when you read something without a proper background, it may convince you while it's not even convincing to its own people. So why would you confuse yourself? Learn your deen first. And this is what exactly you mentioned, the story of Umar ibn Khattab. Finish the Quran and finish what Allah has stated and learn it. Then you'll be capable to refute their misconceptions, answer their false claims, and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach us all what we don't know and help us to act upon what we learn of the beneficial knowledge. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم until next time السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته